And I often tell people I meet who are curious enough to ask about my life story, I say, look around to your left and your right and ask yourself, which one of your friends, not family, which one of your friends would take in your kids if the worst thing happened to you? They're taken in, in love like their own, invest in like their own financial and emotional security of actually raising your kids. And it says a lot about who Tom and Tosh are as people and their circle of friends and influence. I mean, if you haven't already picked up, they're white and they've adopted two black kids. Their circle of influence was wide and it's actually opened up my perspective about what's important to me in terms of building the network of friends, the family you collect as you go through life. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of Crazy Money. This is your host, Paul Ollinger, coming to you live from Atlanta, Georgia. If you're a longtime listener, I'm happy you're here. Welcome back. Hey, the water's warm. Come back in. If you're a new listener, this is Crazy Money. This is a show where we explore the connection between money and happiness through the lens of my guests' expertise and or money journeys in uh, how many episodes? I think this is 89. I think this is number 89. Over almost two years, I've had the great honor to speak not just to prominent academics and authors and winners of the Nobel Prize, the Heisman Trophy, the PGA Championship and Olympic gold medals, but also everyday folks who share their extraordinary money journeys to help us see the world a little bit more clearly, to see it as it is, not as how we've been told we're supposed to see it. So that's really what I'm trying to do here. And today's episode is very much along the lines in that latter category, a regular guy whose life journey will be instructive to all of us. Picture this. You are a 12-year-old boy, the son of a single African mother living in working-class London. Your long-term life and career prospects are very limited. You don't even think you're special or very smart. And then something tragic happens. Your mother dies. And you are, for all intents and purposes, an orphan. But extraordinary people out there decide that they want to intervene and help you live the best life you possibly can. They adopt you and bring you into their home, a home of wealth and affluence and access on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Pretty soon you're attending Riverside Academy, one of the most prestigious schools in the city and thus in all of the United States. And this experience will change the trajectory of your life in so many ways. And that's what happened to today's guest, Kay Madati. And I'll tell you more about him in just a minute. Hey folks, if you're new to the show, please do hit subscribe or follow in the app on which you're listening to the show. That will allow you to get every week's episode delivered directly to your phone. And next week's episode is going to be great also. It's with John Hallowell, the director of the World Happiness Report, which is an annual study of happiness by country around the globe. There's a lot of interesting stuff that comes out of the study. And this year's study helps us understand how COVID has made us happier or less happy. And we'll get into all that too. Hey, if you have feedback or suggestions for future guests, please do drop me a line at paul at crazymoneypodcast.com. I do love to hear from listeners, so please don't hesitate to reach out. I do love to hear from listeners because you know what? Each episode that I make is made with love, great preparation and levity so that you know you get far more insight and laughter than you paid for, which in case you don't remember is nothing. Anyway, seriously, I love making this show. The reading that I do, the preparation that I do, the reflection that I do has helped me, it really has helped me become happier because I'm more aware of the world around me. I'm more grateful for the wonderful things I have in my life. And I hope you found some value in it too. Some of the best episodes have been everyday folks who have trusted me with the intimate details of very private and poignant moments in their lives. Like Julie Saxon, my former Yahoo colleague who described with great candor and strength, the journey she had through her late husband's six-year battle with colorectal cancer. She talked about what it was like to manage her career and her family and, and to receive terrifying medical bills. And I'm just so grateful to her for trusting me with that story. Also, people like AJ Jane, who shared the intimate details of what it was like to, within just a few weeks, lose his house, his marriage, and all of his savings, and then rebuild his life brick by brick. Those have been some of the most successful episodes we've done. And today's episode is very much in that vein, a regular guy who doesn't talk much about himself and kind of considers his own journey to be just normal because it is what happened to him. And yet it is extraordinary in so many ways. One of the things that comes up through this story is the question of privilege. Now, privilege is a trigger word these days. And I think that's because there's a lot of people out there 
in the world that want to make you feel bad about your privilege. And they want to do that because if they can make you feel bad, then they can manipulate you with shame and guilt to act in accordance with the way they want the world to be. But that doesn't necessarily make the world any better. So I have a lot of skepticism when it comes to the concept of privilege, but I do believe, and I believe this deeply, that we should all try to be aware of our privilege and not just the privilege of gender or race, but of parenting. I've been thinking about this a lot since my dad passed away, like how lucky I was to have great parents and what a massive source of privilege that was to me in my life. And Kay's story is this incredible illustrative, illustrative or illustrative, whichever word, of the importance of parenting in a young person's life. Because one day he's the poor child of a single African mother, and a few days later, he's living on the Upper East Side of Manhattan as a rich kid for all intents and purposes. And I'm sure he didn't feel like that right away, but that's what he became. And it was over time attending this incredible school, Riverdale Academy. And I know he didn't feel wealthy right away, but over time, he came to see the opportunities that differentiate the life trajectories of rich kids versus poor kids. And Kay, much to his credit, has dedicated a lot of his adult life to paying that forward. Let me tell you a little bit more about Kay. He was born, as I said before, to a single Tanzanian mother who died when Kay was 12 years old. He and his brother were then adopted by a very affluent professional and Caucasian family who lived on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. His new family situation was an uncanny mirror to the plot of Different Strokes, which was one of the most popular television shows of the early 1980s here in the United States. In a very short period of time, Kay went from a world where, in his words, black kids were never supposed to be anything but working class to a world of elite and nurturing private school in which teachers opened his eyes to his own massive potential. This experience, while rooted in tragedy, is a testimony to the transformative power of adoption and how parenting, education, and access are undeniable sources of privilege in our world. Kay eventually graduated from Georgetown University and went on to a career in media, working for some of the world's most prestigious corporations, including BMW, CNN, Facebook, and BET Networks, where he was the chief digital officer. Most recently, Kay was the global vice president and head of content partnership at Twitter, overseeing the company's worldwide efforts to engage with media and content publishers across TV, sports, news, film, music, and other categories. In 2014, President Obama appointed Kay to the President's Advisory Council on Financial Capability for Young Americans. Today, he serves on the advisory board of Harvard University's Hutchins Center for African and African American Research and is a member of the board of directors of Wingstop, a quickly growing restaurant and franchise concept out of Dallas, Texas. This, my friends, is my interview with Kay Madati. Kay Madati, welcome to Crazy Money. Glad to be here. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for having me. Let's go back to the very beginning. Where were you born and what is your full name? <laughs> I'm a mess. I was born in Norway, Trondheim, Norway, but I'm a Tanzanian citizen, so I only spent the first three months in Trondheim while my mother was finishing her degree at university there. But I'm a Tanzanian citizen. My full name is Kilandigalu Muhammad Madadi, but that's why people call me Kay. (laughs) Just a little bit bit easier. Kay is easier, especially for me. My Southern tongue doesn't get around those (laughs) multi-syllabic names quite as easily. So what were your family's financial circumstances when you were born? That's a hard question because I didn't know. I can guess. My mother was one of the first women in politics in Tanzania. So she was educated and probably just getting started in her career. My father was a diplomat and an ambassador for Tanzania in a variety of different places, Norway, Saudi Arabia, a couple of different places. So I have no idea what they paid. And I don't know what an African nation paid its foreign service people, but If you're educated in Africa, I I think that that is wealth set a different way, right? It might not have been money, but if you had the chance to actually be educated and mostly probably educated outside the country, you were lucky. And how much time did you end up spending in Tanzania as a child? Just the first two years. My mother moved my brother and I to London after my parents got divorced. So I don't really know. I know who my dad is, but he hasn't really been in my life. So you went to London, and how did you find your way eventually to the United States? Oh, that's another interesting story. 
the short answer is that my brother and I were adopted after my mom passed away when we were young. The longer and probably more interesting story is for those first two years in Tanzania, my mom had befriended two McKinsey consultants that the government had hired to help plan an eight to to 10 year economic recovery plan. My mother was coordinator of the project from the Tanzanian side. And those two people, Tom and Patricia, or Tosh is her nickname, Tom and Tosh, became close and fast friends to my mother. And when we moved to England, they stayed in touch. Tosh is British and had moved to the States, emigrated to the States as an adult. And for those years, they became more family than family, became very close to us and the family. We loved them as children. They showed up for our birthdays and Christmas presents and spoiled us rotten and became fast part of our extended family. So when my mom got sick, uh, if you ask them, they'll say, we didn't want to see people we loved thrown into the British foster care system. And so they took us in. We sold what little we had in England and moved as two young teenagers to New York City as adopted kids in their instant family. They had just had my youngest brother, who was five months old. So they had a baby and two teenagers instantaneously. I mean, my mom was a single parent trying to make it in England. Then we moved from that to the Upper East Side of New York, which was different. (laughs) So anybody listening who's over 45 years old will no doubt have bells ringing that this is reminiscent of the plot of a 1970s TV show called Different Strokes. Yes, that has not lost on me. And I used to joke that would make me Willis and make my brother (laughs) honorable. And we like to tease my youngest brother. That makes him Kimberly. (laughs) Kimberly, right. Hopefully his life has worked out better than Kimberly's. And yours has certainly worked out better than the actor who played Willis. (laughs) Yes. Depends how you measure it, I'm sure. (laughs) Well, I think he's had some issues. Anyway, we're not here to disparage him. So you arrive in the United States. You were 13 years old, is that right? 12 and a half, uh, 1986. Yeah, we had been here before. It's actually important to note that Tom and Patricia had so much loved us that in previous years had taken us in for summer vacation. But my mom traveled a lot and, I don't know, starting in like 1970-something, they would volunteer to host us for an entire summer. And we had been flying over to the States where they would rent a house in Connecticut uh, for the summer. And we'd spend like this completely distinctly different summer, or like, I don't know, riding horses, learning how to swim and enjoying life. Uh, so, With all uh, the other Tanzanian kids in Connecticut. I look at these pictures and are completely unaware of what it looks like to see two nappy-haired black kids riding horses in Greenwich, Connecticut. Like, like it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a little bit different. But yeah, coming to America for us on some levels, even though it was on the back end of a tragic loss of our mother, was also a rewarding opportunity for a different kind of life. You told me in a separate conversation that even as a child, as you were at the time, that it was clear to you that this was a surreal thing to do. Were you scared? Not scared because we really did love them like family and knew that we were going to be uh, taken care of in all the ways that young children might need to be taken care of. I think, but I was distinctly aware that life had changed, not just because you have loving parents who maybe um, can afford to do things that you weren't able to afford to do as a single parent family in, in London, but more so from I remember uh, applying to schools. We arrived in America in the middle of the summer. So if you know private school in New York or private school anywhere, like most of those applications had been submitted for seven months. Like people have been told in February that where they're going to go to school. So we arrived in the middle of summer and only a few schools would even see us. And so going for interviews at schools that were already oversubscribed is also an eye-opening experience. And we ended up at a school named Riverdale, which even then at the time was one of the better private schools in the city. And all of a sudden, teachers 
are approaching you in different ways. You know, I had never had aspired to take the A-levels and the O-levels in London. I, I had not aspired to go to university. Like, I just didn't think that that was my path. I didn't think I was a quote-unquote smart person. And then you suddenly get to this fancy school in Riverdale, the Bronx, and they inspire in you that you can do anything that you want, that you are smart and that you just need to work at it and that you can be on the student council, that you can be captain of the soccer team, you can be captain of the track team. I mean, these are all things that nobody had ever thought of me as a leader. Nobody had ever thought of me as somebody who could excel at anything. I had never thought of myself that way. And it's where my passion for education actually begins. I'm happy to talk about that as well. But I fully believe that there's no such thing as dumb kids, only kids that haven't been lit up with the potential that they might be able to apply against the world, which is why I care so much about education in this country and that it shouldn't be just bequeathed to the people who can afford to go to fancy schools like I had a chance to do. What kind of school were you in in London? My mom, again, like she traveled a lot, so we were in a boarding school, but that doesn't necessarily be no like a good school. That just means that we were in the school that looked after us when my mom traveled. I would say if you're lucky enough to get any kind of education in England, in what they call public public school is private school in England. So if you're lucky enough to get a public school education, you're probably doing okay. But my adopted mother, Tosh, would say that my brother and I were the victims of an antiquated caste system and racist system where black kids were never supposed to be anything more than, I don't know, working class. My aperture about what was possible for me might have been driven by my own thoughts, but probably was also driven by the fact that I wasn't ever thought of as anything more than below average. I literally did not think I was going to be anything more than like, and quite happy, by the way, or anything more than going into the working class, maybe working at a grocery store or something like that. So, right. But you know, what does a 12 year old know at that point? So. so how was the experience of acclimating to school in America? Did the other kids welcome you? Yeah. Riverdale to this day remains a big part of, of my heart. There were only 110 kids in the class. So very quickly we got to know everybody. We were different. Diversity wasn't as much of a thing. Back then, I think I was only one of four black kids in my class. But black kid with an English accent with a different kind of story. Uh, slowly, mostly because my brother and I were open about it, people got to hear our stories. So I don't know. There's a lot of empathy about kids who have had to go through things like that at a young age. But it wasn't as hard as I thought. And most importantly, I felt like I was super supported. I am still friends with many other teachers and deans from from that school who have stayed in my life and have been a part of all of my successes and trials and tribulations over the years. We were taken in. It made it a lot easier. From the minute that we got here, from family to family friends to schools to friends at school, it made the whole transition a lot easier. Do you think that the fact that your adoptive parents were people of uh, means and professional success and notoriety, did that help people want to be nice to you? Um, I would argue that no is the answer. New York City private school is is rife with people of means. <laughs> right. uh, Who, by so. the way, were pissed off that you guys got into school and their kids didn't get into school. There is somebody that didn't get into Riverdale that was furious when you showed up. Right. Well, that's probably right. No, I think as a parent now, I think about what kinds of people would do what they did. And I often tell people I meet who are curious enough to ask about my life story. I say, look around to your left and your right and ask yourself, which one of your friends, not family, which one of your friends would take in your kids if the worst thing happened to you? They're taken in in love like their own, Mm. invest in like their own financial and emotional security of actually raising your kids. And it's a big thing. And it says a lot about who Tom and Tosh are as people and their circle of friends and influence. I mean, if you haven't already picked up, they're they're white and they've adopted two black kids. Their circle of influence was wide. To this day, I think they love Africa more than I love Africa. But um, (laughs) they probably spent more time in the country than I have. When you look at a disparate group of family, friends, uh, and extended, it's every shade, every color, 
of people around the world. And it's actually opened up my perspective about what's important to me in terms of building the network of friends, the family you collect as you go through life that bring all kinds of different perspectives. So I think it's not about us, it was about them that we were taken in by their extended family and friends that I'm not completely sure how we managed to get to the directors of admissions at some of these schools that are already oversubscribed, but it had to be about them and not so much about us, uh, these two young kids. So they're wonderful, wonderful people, human beings for sure. So we're all flawed, but they're aspirational in what I might want for myself. Did you know how to act and what to wear when you were a newcomer to New York City? Not just New York City, but like Park Avenue, right? The Upper East Side, the most affluent and sophisticated area of the country. Uh, The answer to that question is no. There was an ample share of ignorance, like which actually probably served my brother and I well. Like, if you don't know and you just roll out uh, and you go where you want to go, like it's up to the world then to react to that. The answer is no. I have this great story about showing up. I came in in eighth grade and my brother came in in seventh grade and it's bar mitzvah season. I had no idea what a bar mitzvah was. And I asked my friend three days into school, Judah, Judah Pollock in, invited me to his bar mitzvah, which was on the weekend. And I was like, what's a bar mitzvah? And he said, it's a party. So I showed up to the Rainbow Room in New York City, uh, 52nd floor of Rockefeller Center, in my best jean jacket and jeans <laughs> to a black tie bar mitzvah party. Like, <laughs> like uh, I had no idea. And while there are layers to this story that may highlight the worst of society. I mean, the maitre d' didn't believe that I was a guest, and so sent me to the kitchen. But then I was saved by Judah's mom, who was furious and pulled me into the party. And so there are these great pictures of me surrounded by kids in black tie and me wearing my jeans and my jean jacket. So I did not know how to fit in. I didn't know that you had to fit in. I was just a kid. And my parents, to their credit, are not caught up in all of that nonsense. And so we had an affluent groundedness. (laughs) And to this day, my parents say, you know, that they're not sure I I ever survived, you know, hanging out with all of these uh, wealthy kids. But yeah, we just did our own thing. We were were already an odd looking family. We lived in a nice place on the Upper East Side. And there are many stories through my youth where I, I was stopped by police walking into my own house. There's lots of those kinds of stories, which as I got older, I began to revel in our difference and and knew that it wasn't about me. It was about the people who were asking the questions. In fairness to your story about wearing denim to a bar mitzvah, I wore denim to the Goldberg bat mitzvah in Pacific Palisades last year. So, And I've lived in the United States far longer than you had at the point. I'm an ignorant goy, so you know I hadn't had the intricacies of Los Angeles bar mitzvahs explained to me, except by my knucklehead friend who's the dad who told me that it would be fine. (laughs) My adopted father seemed to tell me that I don't think you're supposed to wear jeans, but he was good enough to let me walk out the door <laughs> like that. Oh, well, he'll learn one way or the other, you know? I mean, That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> so you said grounded affluence. How did your adoptive parents address the issue of their affluence and help you understand where you fit into the world at that point? It's hard to say, but I'm not sure I ever felt wealthy, but objectively, Now, looking back many years, we're going to one of the top schools in the country. My parents are paying. There were three boys at one point in our family. I went to Georgetown. My brother went to Stanford. My other brother went to Harvard. And then before that, he was at uh, Andover School. So just put those (laughs) tuitions It's a lot of tuition, right. Yeah, In a year. So we weren't poor by any means. Let's start with my mother. My mother was British, grew up in probably a middle class, lower, lower to middle class British family, had come to America to teach tennis at Tufts. Beyond that, had not thought much more about what her future was going to look like. And at, at Tufts, she met the provost of the school and taught his daughter and then got to be very close to the family. And the family, he said one day, well, you should apply to Harvard Business School. I mean, maybe this is more law than than fact, but she didn't really know much about it, but applied and became 
one of the first women to get into, first sets of women to get into Harvard Business School, which is where she met my dad. And he was a Harvard Business School person, and he had finished three tours and serving in the military. He was a West Point graduate and was coming back from, from Vietnam and all of that stuff. And they met there. So I tend to look at them as self-made, hardworking people who have both in some cases served this country and in other cases, in my mom's case, being the benefits of of this country. And their first job out of business school was both of them went to McKinsey, which is still one of the best consulting firms in the world right now. So I think there was a huge connection to work and ethic. I was a better student as I got older. <laughs> my brothers were both very, very good. You know, they did their homework, whereas I waffled through most of it. But the connection of work and the output to success or to to winning was very clear. We were not caught up in like the fancy vacations, uh, you know, when everybody else went to Aspen for the summer or wherever else. We took a station wagon and we drove to Maine and had an outdoors wedding, like uh, outdoor summer. So as much as you can be grounded inside of that world as you can. But I had friends who most certainly had things. I don't know. I kind of, as an outsider looking in, I understood what it was not to have all of this, which was my life in England, and tried to frame it up in a way where you don't get too caught up in it and don't take it for granted and realize how lucky you are. Teachers are taking an interest, telling you you can be anything you choose to be. You mentioned you went to Georgetown. I'm curious as to how you got there and if this new experience of being told that you can do anything, did the infinite choice of where you could go and what you could do with this new opportunity, did that freak you out at all? So it's a multi-layered question. Let's start with belief in self and where that came from. School and parents and still these, when you get voted to lead the soccer team by your peers, you begin to believe in your ability. When you get voted to the student council by your peers and your school, you begin to believe in that people actually want to hear from you and, and that you have something to offer. Uh, that coupled with the ability to be like, sometimes think like, so in my free time, and I've really put my words to action and I've opened two charter schools, kindergarten through eighth, one in Brooklyn and one in Atlanta. And What's absolutely clear to me, kids only know what they see. So now I'm in this environment where my parents' business friends come over for dinner, or they're supporting a senator on a race or a congressman for a race, and that person is over for dinner. My mother was one of the highest ranking women at the time, well, the highest ranking woman at the time at Xerox, and she ran their biggest division. And she was on all sorts of magazines, cover of Forbes and Fortune and so on and so forth. So even if I don't understand it all as a kid, you begin to see what's possible. And I think that that's what education at its best really does. It opens up the aperture for a kid to actually dream and dream and think about what's possible for themselves. So it became, whereas I came into that school, not really sure that I ever wanted to go to college. By the time I got to 10th grade, There was no choice. It wasn't even, it was like, of course I'm going to college and of course I'm going to try hard and study and do well on these tests and apply to a variety of schools. I was lucky that I applied to six schools and I got into every school except Harvard. I got into UPenn, Northwestern, Georgetown, McAllister, Michigan, all great phenomenal schools. And then had the ability to go out and visit. And and this is where I really love my parents. It's something that you don't really appreciate until you're older. You'd have thought that they would have said on a ranking wise, okay, you're going to the Ivy League. (laughs) You're going to that school. But my parents were the opposite. My parents wanted me to go to McAllister in Minnesota. They're like, you're a kid who needs small schools (laughs) and needs as much attention as possible. Otherwise, it's going to go sideways. It's a really Uh, good school. (laughs) It's not as well known as Penn, but... Right. But they were like, you got to find a school that's the right fit for you. And for a long time, because I ran track, I had gone to the Penn Relays at Penn as a high schooler. And so I was like, I want to go to Penn. And once I got in, I was super excited. And then I visited and I didn't feel feel the vibes. and, uh, and uh, And then I visited Georgetown, this jewel in the middle of D.C. with all of this land and grass. Yeah. And, yeah. and so I made a pivot. I mean, listen, you're talking about 
all great schools. It would not done wrong in any direction. If Georgetown's your fallback, you're doing okay. <laughs> I, uh, I was I was lucky lucky to go there at that time. You know, this is Alonzo Morning, Allen Iverson years, like good basketball time. <laughs> right, right. Great academics, great basketball in the middle of one of the coolest cities in the country. I mean, like it's right. a great setup. I've mentioned this in the introduction that I'm recording separately, but you've had a great career. You've worked at BET, you've worked at CNN, you had leadership roles at Facebook and Twitter. What would K. Madati have done absent the intervention of your adoptive parents? Where would he have ended up? Oh, absolutely. I can definitively say I would not be anywhere close to any of these things. I'll tell you. So my first job out of college was at BMW. And I joined in what they, I don't even know what it's still around, but they called it a management training program. They took three MBA graduates and they took three undergraduates. So it was really hard to get into. And that was balanced against going to sell my soul to Goldman Sachs uh, <laughs> on, on Wall Street. Then the jobs were great. Goldman Sachs offer was three times as much coming out of college versus BMW. But, you know, I'm a kid. I like cars. Like It was, it was not a choice. Like I went to BMW. And I remember on day one, you go, you fill out the HR forms. They say, okay, now you got to go to the company garage and pick up your company car. And I'd never driven a BMW in my life. And I'm some 20 something year old kid. And the guy is literally just handing it to me like it's nothing. Okay, here are the keys and here are the instructions. Go, go. And I went and pulled over into a parking lot and I just took a breath. I was like, this is not supposed to be my life. Like, um, Which model BMW did you choose? It was a three series coupe. And yeah, it was a surreal moment. Uh, and I've had many of them in my life, many of them that have been provided either by family or by work or by virtue of being at Obama's inauguration, serving on on one of the presidential councils, or sitting next to the CEO of Citibank, who was also on the same council as me, or an ex-British kid attending Wimbledon and sitting in the royal in the royal box with the Duke of Gloucester right in front of me. Like I mean, these are places and things that are not supposed to happen in my life. And I am distinctly aware there are I'd say maybe four or five times a year where I turn around and you just stop and you pause. And you say, I'm lucky. Uh, by virtue of a turn of fate, it could be a very different different life and a different outcome. And so I'm, I'm grateful. That was my next question. I was like, do you have to remind yourself to be grateful or does it just continue to hit you over the head? There's a fair amount of imposter syndrome. I don't know whether you've heard this thing. Uh, somebody's labeled it, but it's like, it, it never stops me from doing what I have to do. Even when I got the job at Facebook or got nominated to this presidential council by the president and so on and so forth. There's this ability that I'm not supposed to be in the room, this belief like innately because I know where I've come from. (laughs) That never goes away. I, I remember who I am. I know what I've been able to accomplish and I've not been perfect and not been great at everything, but there's always this piece of me that's, uh, I should not be here. So it's, I don't need a reminder. It's, it's built into my DNA. The, the, as some people say, I got to get over that imposter syndrome. Sometimes you've just got to be like, you're in the room, you're on this presidential council, there's right. 30 other people on it. You've got the CEO of the Citibank, the CEO of the Boys and Girls Club of America, the CEO of Visa, and you are being asked for your opinion on the same level as these people. You may not be their peers in life, but there's a value that you can contribute here. And the president has asked you to be a part of this. So uh, I don't think I need any reminders. I am the improbable story of life. Some people would address imposter syndrome by going over the top with Rolexes and Ferraris and whatever. And, you know, like they would try to appear to belong in the room. And in so doing, they would make it clear that, you know, that they're not that kind of person, that they're trying too hard. I don't know any other way to be than than just me. Authenticity. I know that there are like these rules, like how to be a member of the club, what to wear. And then, yes, there's certain protocols when you meet royalty, what you're supposed to do like, and things like that. Mm-hmm. But beyond that, I'm an anathema to trying to be something that I'm, that I'm not. I'm just not credible. Most people who try are not <laughs> un- credible. So you're left with like, you just got to be authentic. And the more that I have tried to be that person myself, the more valuable it's been to me as a human being. And it's an easier way to live than trying to fit. I'm not trying to fit in. I certainly like my toys like everybody else. <laughs> like, right, uh, right. 
but I'm not buying a watch just because apparently you need one to be perceived as, I'll say this and maybe people would disagree, the insular world of the New York City upper class is not just wealthy people, but arguably some of the most influential people in the country. And money may be where that influence begets. And so what I realized very early on, the people with the most influence don't have to tell you in a room. The ones who are loudest are the ones that you should worry the most about. But, That's what uh, I was going to say. It's not the person who feels he doesn't belong in the room that you need to watch out for. It's the guy who's like, why am I not in charge? That's right. That's exactly right. We had in my high school parents, the CEO of Sony Corporation. We had the CEO of DLJ, which was one of the big boutique investment banks. Donaldson, Lufkin, Jenner. Uh, yep, yep, exactly. And a bunch of other muckety mucks parents that I probably don't know. And those people that they had things, but I don't think they had to show things. You mentioned charter schools. What do you hope to accomplish through your work with charter schools? I want to model my life. The story into how I got pulled into it. I have this very good friend, uh, Omar Wasau, who was an, is an entrepreneur, but now a Princeton professor. Omar grew up in a family with two teachers, and so education was really, really big. He's a really smart person, and he had started a couple of social networks at the time of Friendster that became the largest social networks targeted against Asian population, the African-American population, and the uh, Latino population. And this became a huge, big company at the time when social networking, this is pre-Facebook, it's hard to imagine. Yep. And Omar and I had become friends, we were introduced at a business thing, but then we became very good friends. And he had said, hey, how would you like to help me start a charter school? Which then pulled me into like, well, what's a charter school and well, what do we hope to do here? And at the core of my experience is an understanding that education changed my perspective on my life. And so why should that be provided just to somebody who can afford to send somebody to a school like Riverdale? Um, it didn't just get you into college. It changed your perspective on your life. Absolutely. Those are two very different things. Like there's the functional, like, okay, you got into a good college, but really your perspective on how you looked at the world and what was possible for you in explicit and non-explicit ways. Finding out what a CEO of Sony is and did, I mean... Uh, <laughs> I got to meet Michael Jackson because of him, because Michael Jackson was uh, a Sony artist. How's your therapy going? <laughs> it was at the bad concert days. But, okay, good. You were, you're out of danger. <laughs> but even learning what that was and what a job was, like, how does this guy know Michael Jackson? And why does he get to take me here? Like, it, it just opens your aperture as to like, oh, maybe I want to do that. <laughs> you know. Uh, and so I wanted to, my passion for joining Omar on this adventure that I knew very little about came from like, I want to replicate what I did to kids who would never have that opportunity. And I don't think that money needs to do it. And so charter schools at its essence allow for that kind of vision to come to life. We failed the first two times. We applied to New York City charter schools and we were rejected. We pulled together a board and a packet. We were rejected two years in a row. And on the third year, 1999, our proposal got accepted after interviewing with like New York State Secretary of Education. I mean, this is a big vetting process and, and a big deal. And then before you know it, we're breaking ground in bed Brooklyn on a $15 million building and applying. My perspective is like, I, what do I know about education? But I know what it takes to build an enterprise and to apply my business acumen to helping get a school off the ground and, and hire teachers and principals and stuff like that. And so that's where it came from. That My passion for charter schools I avoid the politics around it and just think about like if this school did not exist in this community in Brooklyn, 750 kids would be stuck in failing public schools. That is an actual fact. Uh, it's not hyperbole. For those 750 kids and their extended families, the ability to have gotten a lottery ticket and attend this school has changed the trajectory of their education, their lives, the potential, the way that they think about the future, which is what happened to me at Riverdale. Do you think a poor kid in America can make it on hard work alone? No. <laughs> no, because educational systems fail poor people, disadvantaged neighborhoods. Our school population in Brooklyn is mostly single parent family, so single parent and working family. So we had to actually 
open it and think about like, what do we do with the kids between three and six? Because the parents aren't home, right? You send the kids home at three, there's no oversight. So everything that you might've worked on in school suddenly gets thrown out the window until somebody's actually looking after the kids. So we actually stay open a lot longer. Our programs run deeper into the day and we have after school programs that most of the kids subscribe to as well. So I know that this country is built on this vision of like, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, but the playing field isn't even. I'm a perfect example of that. I'm a black kid that got adopted into a, a wealthy family and suddenly my trajectory changes. Uh, what's changed? Well, you look at the data on that. It's uh, access to great teachers, access to great schools, access to people who actually instill a sense of confidence in you in different ways that you may not be getting at home. And the ability, like when I wasn't doing well on the SAT test, my parents could afford to send me to Kaplan. Right? So now that's not an even playing field against the kid from public school who might have to walk his way to school through neighborhoods and an environment that isn't conducive to telling you you're the best thing in the world. <laughs> show, up at, uh, show up at a school where you hopefully have teachers who are going to invest in you. New York City public schools averaging 45 kids in the area of Brooklyn, 45 kids per class. Wow. So if you're not naturally good, you're not getting looked after or the entire class is slowed down, which is what we actually found. It's not that public school teachers are bad people. It's that you can't manage a class with 45 kids, right? And so you end up teaching to the lowest common denominator, which means any kid who's good at anything is actually being held back. So it's not an even playing field. It's, it's actually one of America's biggest failings as far as I'm concerned. Urban school, public, actually not even urban school. You could get to places like West Virginia where you got the same problem in a different way. It's amazing to me that we don't invest more, that it's not at the top of every ballot ticket that people don't run on, like, let's get our kids educated. Let's provide them semi-level, the playing field and the opportunity to participate. One of our biggest learnings when we open a school. So we open a school kindergarten through eight. But what you learn is the trajectory of a kid's learning can only be affected at extreme amounts, like at the early years. And so if you have a fifth grader to a sixth grader, your ability to actually change the trajectory of the learning is lessened. And you, so you need to start earlier. So we actually opened the school kindergarten through fifth and grew up into the sixth or seventh and eighth grade years. And when we took in, because we're a lottery school, you take in whoever is lucky enough to get in. We found that most of the kids were a grade to a grade and a half behind. <laughs> and so we had to like create after school programs, tutoring opportunities and so on and so forth to get everyone caught up. But what we realized was after a couple of years, we had a really well-functioning and operating school. But what you realize is that's not where the story ends. When you get to seventh grade, what we realized was if you don't actually get the kids out of Brooklyn, they won't ever apply for scholarships at the private schools in New York City because the majority of our kids have never been out of Brooklyn which is hard to imagine. It's a train ride into Manhattan, right? We started creating bus tours and we would call all of these private schools and we would we'd grab the parents and the kids. We sometimes got schools to see us on weekends and we would bring them to these schools that they would never have ever, look at Dalton, look at Riverdale, look at Horace. And they've got to look like Hogwarts to these kids. Right, right. it's just it's very, very different. And not every kid in our graduating eighth graders are going to be able to get into this, but three to four could out of a class of whatever it was, um, 30 kids, and they could probably qualify for scholarships and they could get a, a chance. So it's not just about getting the kids educated. It's also exposing them to more than what they see in their daily lives. Like I had a parent tell me at the eighth grade graduation, our board was all young-ish people, except one person who was a, an ex-principal. And we are all mostly people of color. We had a majority people of color board and a parent came up to me and says, you have no idea what it's like for me and my family and my kids to look up at successful people of color. Like, they don't see this. They see uh, rappers and basketball players and et cetera, but they don't actually see, like, my friend James Bernard, who was one of our core board members, founded The Source magazine. Omar is an entrepreneur, founded Black Planet, Asian Avenue, and uh, all of these social networks. I was working at BMW at the time as an executive there. We had a principal at school. I mean, these present opportunities and windows to how kids and people can actually dream dream differently and dream to be different things. I'm not suggesting that people wanted to become us, but the connection between what we were doing at the school and your future 
becomes more tacit. Just because you can give them an example that they can say, oh, I could, I could see me doing that. I could be like that guy. Absolutely. And we had, we did lots of things with career things. We leveraged our own Rolodexes to bring people to the school, councilmen to the school. And our Brooklyn school has become a really big part of that community. That's the other thing. The school is not just the education place. We open up on the weekends for community events and stuff like that. So uh, being a part of the actual part of bed has been critical too. Well, the work you all are doing sounds amazing, and I'm so glad you're there to do it. As an example, not just of success, but of humility and just all-around good guyness. So, Unfortunately, I had to resign from the board. I couldn't commute to Brooklyn for the monthly board meetings anymore, but I <laughs> still connect. From Los Angeles. We're not talking about a train ride. It's from LA. Okay. <laughs> That's right. The same thing happened in Atlanta. I was, for a little while, I was doing the Atlanta school, but it, even that got hard. <laughs> Would it make sense to put a link to the uh, school's resources so, so if anybody was interested, they could uh, make a donation to those schools? Absolutely. Atlanta What's, Heights Charter School and Brooklyn Excelsior Charter School. So those are two schools. Yeah, we should do that. So we will put links in the show notes if you are interested in finding out more about those two schools. Hey, one last question. You've got an 11-year-old daughter. What kind of values around money and work and success do you want to pass on to her? Well, she has two parents who work really hard. And it's interesting. By osmosis, she already connects the way that we live to the amount of work that we do. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, on some levels, it's probably not what a parent wants a kid to understand as early as she has. But my ex is a OBGYN. I'm in tech and business land, and we both work a lot. My ex does overnights in the hospital often. She has long days from 7 a.m. sometimes to 7 or 8 p.m. And while we prioritize spending our downtime with our daughter, she has understood that both her parents work really hard and because they work really hard, that's how we get to live. I am probably a little bit dogmatic about trying to do what my parents did with me, which is like, she has a distinct awareness that her life is lucky as well. Like she goes to a fancy school here in Beverly Hills. We don't have some of the things that other people have, but we have a very good life. And she is lucky enough to have a computer at home and doesn't have to borrow one from the school. And and I think as a young 11-year-old, I'm pretty proud of how she's a waiter, that things are special. So I want her to work hard. More importantly, actually, before all of that stuff, I think I just want her to be a kind and, and generous kid in a world that is increasingly not emphasizing that in children. She's a good kid. And if she could have some version of the life that I built where we have an extended group of friends and family, all my parents have built, but that's win number one. And secondly, yeah, I want her to work hard, but I also want her to like chase her passions. Like we don't let her quit things when she starts. Like, so if she says she's doing piano, she's doing it for a whole semester, <laughs> even though she may hate it <laughs> halfway through. There's values that we've learned along the way that are embedded, but um, she's a good kid. I'm lucky. Well, if kindness and generosity are hereditary, and I believe they are, then she's off to a really good start with you as a dad. So Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. I know our listeners are going to find your story very compelling. Uh, thanks for the questions. I don't talk about this stuff that often, so it's odd, but thank you. I appreciate <laughs> you sharing them with us. Thank you, Kay. I enjoyed that conversation and you know, really appreciate your time. I didn't mention this up top, but Kay and I overlapped just slightly in our time working at Facebook. And while we had met each other professionally once or twice, that's the most amount of time I had spent with him. So I really enjoyed the opportunity of getting to know him better than I had in the past. So thanks for sharing your time with me, Kay, and for the trust you showed by allowing us to share your story with our listeners. Your story is extraordinary. Now, all of our stories have extraordinary elements, but certainly yours is a very dramatic one in the sense that you go from being a, a pubescent kid who suffers a tragedy and losing your mom and then remain open to what life has in front of you. And luckily you were blessed with extraordinary parents who gave you opportunities you never would have had otherwise. Well, let's talk about those in the takeaway. All right, let's look at three sources of privilege. And again, you don't have to feel bad about your privilege, but you should be aware of it, right? So for those of us who come from solid families, we need to be aware that not everybody has that. And Kay's story is a brilliant example of the importance of good parents and what a powerful tool adoption is to change a young person's life and give them the opportunity to reach their potential. What if Kay's new mom and dad hadn't stepped up? 
the world would be less rich without the cultivated mind and sense of self that they helped Kay develop. And wow, when you look back at it, you go, holy cow, how important it is. And so hats off to all you parents out there who have adopted children, my own in-laws, specifically, you know, what opportunities you've given my wife through your trust and love and all my peers out there who are adopting foster kids and kids from around the world. Hats off to you. You are doing perhaps the greatest service an adult can do for another child who isn't there. So hats off. Education, huge privilege. Case story, same kid, same brain, same athletic ability, and yet with the right nurturing at the right school at Riverdale Academy, Kate's trajectory absolutely changes with different inputs from his teachers in preparation, and a whole new world opens up. Hugely powerful. Third, the last privilege is access. He not only saw how successful people lived and conducted themselves, but they taught him the secret codes to to professional society. You know, they helped him run the gauntlet of college admissions and parsing professional opportunities. And again, if your parents don't know much about the business world, you're going to have to figure it out on your own. And it's not that any one of us can't do that. It's that it's just a whole lot easier if you see it growing up than if you got to figure it out on your own when you're 24 or 25 years old or whatever. Anyway, thanks again, K. Madati. Thanks to you, dear listener, for sticking with us all the way through the end of this episode. We'll be back next week with another episode. John Hellowell, director of the World Happiness Report, joins us from Vancouver, British Columbia. And I can't wait to share that conversation with you. In the meantime, if you like this show, please rate or review it. Be sure to subscribe so that you get next week's episode right there to your phone. And with that, I will say thank you to my editor, producer, and friend, Mike Carano. Mike, make me sound smart.